We are at day six countdown for Belize getting to make the most important decision that we've ever made having a Belizean passport. And we're continuing our conversation and we have the pleasure of um, Paco Smith, who's a researcher, and he's going to be talking to us in another capacity. We are used to you in BPP, um, in yeah. different um, political, but this is your research. And although it has a specific target, it is research that you're bringing out. The research is entitled Enemy Within Selective Governance Practices, Belize's Greatest Security Threats. Morning, Paco. Yes, good morning, good morning. All right. Mm -hmm. So can you give us the, the thesis statement for your research paper? Maybe we can start there. OK, well, basically, the research, uh, as you mentioned, was tailored to a specific um, uh, occasion, which was the Belize National Research Conference, the second one that was held uh, earlier this year. And it was under the theme of Belize's security strengths, opportunities, and threats. So within that regard, fundamentally, this paper looks at the question of Belize's security, but it puts forth the, the notion that the normal, the normal approach to looking at uh, Belize's security from an external or an outward looking perspective uh, is something that could be challenged. And it's to look, it looks at the reality of selective governance practices by policymakers and how it can and does affect the nation of Belize. Now, clearly, the role that you have taken on in this discourse has been one of uh, speaking out against going to the ICJ and being very critical of some of the decisions along this way. How much of your own personal uh, views has been the basis of this research itself? Fundamentally, from the perspective of a researcher, I have to put aside my biases. And that's precisely what I did. So with regards to your question, um, the approach is a fundamental research approach, to set aside one's biases and look at the facts. So what was the method? How did you approach it? Um, from what angle and what tools did you use to, um, to base your, 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 re your, your, your research? It was fundamentally an uh, analytical expository um, approach in that I looked at <coughs> excuse me, conference papers, uh, news articles, things of that nature. Um, and in the research itself, I also acknowledge the fact that although this particular one is complete, I look at it as being part and parcel of potentially a project because many other aspects can dovetail from it. So let's talk about what you have found. So your, your <coughs> thesis is selective governance practices that they are essentially Belize's greatest security threat. How so? How so? Well, first and foremost, when we look at selective governance practices, it's important to understand that there's a cost. Um, the governance practices, well, the selective governance practices that I looked at run the gamut. And again, it was tailored towards sorry, the- Sorry, sorry, you said the selective government. governance practices run the gamut? What yes. does that mean? Yes, it runs the gamut in terms of Belizean society, Belizean politics, what have you. For example, the theme of the, the research conference was Belize's security um, opportunities and threats. And there were some sub-themes beneath it, uh, including national security, um, sovereignty, and a lot of other things like that. So basically, when I say that it runs the gamut, it looks at different elements that have occurred between the year Belize received independence in 1981 up mm -hmm. to 2018. So let's, let's not keep it too general because we are <coughs> time constrained. So mm -hmm. when you talk about selective governance practices, what practices are you talking about? Okay, well, I looked at six of them. Yes. All right. Um, one involved the, <coughs> excuse me, the nationalization of Guatemala, excuse me, the nationalization of Guatemala nationals. We also looked at the UH, uh, UHS health scandal. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Of course, I looked at the 2008 assigning of the compromis. Mm -hmm. We also looked at the most recent um, nationality issues that took place with regards to visas and passports and what have you. Let's see, how many is that, four? Four. Four, okay, two more. Oh, we looked at the 
ongoing land scandals that have been taking place recently and ever since uh, we probably had a lands department. Mm -hmm. And there's one more. Oh, yes, the nationalization of BTL. Okay. You say we. You say we look like when you say well, we. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm speaking collectively. Yeah. Is your research It's paper? fundamentally my research, yes. Okay. You, you had, were the you ones had, who presented. You, you were the one who presented. You had assistance from? It was solely me. It was solely me. Okay. okay. So looking at these six specific um, issues, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about which one stood out to you the most. And in, in terms of your presentation, the first was the ongoing scandals at the Lands Department. Yes. Is that because that seems to be the greatest, the most critical issue? No, not necessarily. Um, that isn't the one that really stood out to me uh, the most. Um, I have to give credence to the fact that they are all examples of egregious uh, decision making, in my, in my opinion. But um, it, with regards to that one specifically, well, I mean, for example, the Prime Minister himself uh, said at one point that the Lands Department, and I can't remember his exact words, but he's, he admitted that there's a lot of corruption. Hot bed of corruption. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you choose these specific um, governance practices? And why do you call them government practices when they're really pretty much scandals? Decisions or decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it was based on the different themes that were presented with regards to the, the simple, excuse me, to the uh, conference itself. And again, they, it ran the gamut, meaning uh, citizen security, national security. It talked about uh, the economy, sustainable development, sovereignty, diplomacy. It was a whole line of sub-themes beneath the uh, mm -hmm. overall theme. So, I mean, we, we haven't had the liberty of going through the entire research yes. paper, so we'll depend on you to be able to extract some of the highlights. Mm -hmm. um, when you're trying to tie issues together, you're talking about um, the signing of the compromise, the nationalization of BTL, the UHS scandal, um, the Guatemalan nationals being granted citizenship. How do these, how do you link them to issues of security for a country? Some are natural. When you talk about passport, visa, and nationality scandals, clearly you don't know who's getting these documents, so mm -hmm. you have uh, an influx of persons who perhaps don't legitimately hold these documents. But others, perhaps the UHS scandal, um, and others that you cited, the Lands Department scandal, how do these pose a security threat? Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. And one of the fundamental things that I wanted to get across is that these um, type of decisions by our policymakers come at a cost. When you look at the situation of the UHS, again, well, we, most of us know um, what was reported. Mm -hmm. And from an economic standpoint, in terms of eventually what was owed and what was paid, uh, it, it has a, an effect on the economy. And in particular with regards to that one, if I recall correctly, the continued um, taking of the, the case on and on with regards to uh, different elements also exacerbated the situation. I know that was partic particularly the case with regards to BTL, mm -hmm. right? But uh, again, fundamentally from an economic standpoint. So because it costs us so much, oh, yeah, that's absolutely. how you tie it into a security is Oh, absolutely. That's the link that you were making. That's one of the links that I'm making. Because okay. when you look at um, the uh, amounts of money that are being, that have been paid out with regards to some of these court decisions that could have been capped at a certain point, but because of the government's decision to continue on through litigation, again, there's a cost. And with regards to the monies that were spent, um, those monies could have been placed uh, towards national security, could have been placed towards other things. And how did you, sorry, and how, <coughs> and how did you make that, um, and how did you make that transition in terms of um, linking the, the, the financial economic impact of those decisions to the absences of um, security measures? So did you go yeah. through the, what it Cost. would mean for the um, employing more police officers to have more outposts at the border? W w did it allow you the space and time to be able to go a little bit in more detail to how it could have been used in a better way? Well, that's part two. That's, that's part, part two. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, yes, as I mentioned, um, it's a work in progress. This one, specifically for that particular conference, is complete. But I can see where it can dovetail into elements such as that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Now, isn't, you know, if, if you look at uh, the court cases as they've played out, it could be just looking at one side of the coin because had the results been different, mm -hmm. you perhaps would not have called it an exercise uh, that le increases or security threat. Well, that's the bottom line. We dealt with what was there, what happened, what occurred. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, look at the detail one. Just thinking it through, mm -hmm. because this is the purpose of research, and that's why research is so yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, gives the, it gives the dispassionate forum for people to just discuss issues, even if it's only for academic purposes. Yes. What if some people were to argue that the nationalization of BTL was a, not a security risk, mm -hmm. but a security strength? Because no longer is BTL, even though there's an economic cost to it, that the but silent hand is really that now we control, not necessarily in terms of, um, it, it also in terms of the ownership that no Belizeans own it. So no longer do we have um, a, a private person owning it, but the government and the people of Belize know one fifty one percent. So no, it's not a security strength. How do you respond to that? Well, in keeping with what you said uh, when you prefaced what you uh, just uh, spoke on, I'll say that um, from a researcher's perspective, uh, that's something that I'd be very much interested in. in exploring some more. No, well, not necessarily exploring, but uh, seeing what, what type of information comes out of that perspective. Um, I'm open-minded in that sense. I'm not saying that it's not possible. And if someone takes up that opportunity, I, I would love to read that research. But what, from the research that you've done, you've clearly determined that it is a security threat. And in coming to um, it being a security threat, you must have um, unpacked why it is. And so you've looked at both the pros and the cons of it happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so in your research, can't you... What does it show? Yeah, what does it show? Well, yes. again, with regards to the BTL situation, I'm just going to call out a number here. Mm -hmm. U.S. $78.16 million in compensation, right? Yes. Approximately 80.4% was to be paid in U.S. dollars. Mm. That in and of itself, at least based on the research that I conducted, demonstrates that um, those monies could have been placed towards something more constructive, whether it be in the security apparatus or what have you. So again, with the regards to the BTL one, the theme or the sub-theme that was captured within it involves the economy. And that would be, so, okay, so I'm trying to, clearly, when you talk about uh, UHS, you talk about the nationalization, you're talking about an economic perspective, which I think people have said casually oftentimes, you, you simply grounded it in research, which is the money that we paid for this could have gone to something yeah. better for the country. But Absolutely. talk to me about some of the other areas. So uh, mm -hmm. the, scand the land scandals, the passport scandals, mm -hmm. and even the, uh, the granting of citizenship to Guatemalan nationals. What is your basis of your research in how these are tied to security risks? Okay, with regards to the, the issue involving the granting of Belizean citizenship to Guatemalan nationals, again, well, with regards to the Constitution, Section 29.3, if I'm correct. I may be wrong with that. That is a security uh, concern because, and I'll give it to you in factual examples, right? And again, it depends on one's perspective. But we have had instances, and again, there are different categories with regards to the granting of citizenship. But we have had instances of Guatemalan-born nationals who have uh, entered the political realm and have actually run in elections and, mm -hmm. and are poised to potentially win, no? Now, In Belize? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's a potential for that. There are several, at least one or two that I, I noted, that have actually contested general elections, right? So, Which two are those? Uh, well, the one that immediately comes to mind is Denny Grijalva in Orange Walk. Okay. Right. And there's another one, but I can't recall the name right. And yeah, uh, continue to elaborate. Yes. And How does this tie? That's a security risk. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, that in and of itself, because when you look at the, the, the situation, potentially, and given the system of governance that we employ here in Belize, there is the potential that a Guatemalan-born individual who acquires Belizean citizenship could someday be the head of government. Undoubtedly. I mean, that is a distinct possibility. 
Mm -hmm. why, why is that a threat? I mean, it's no different. There are lots of, um, in other countries, you have persons who are not, are, I mean, I think in America, one of the candidates was born in Puerto Rico, one of the hopefuls for presidential. So it's not uncommon for somebody who's not necessarily born in that country or somebody who is probably that first generation. Um, well, I'm not sure which one you're referring to with regards to the United States. I know that John McCain was, was born in Panama on a U.S. naval base, I believe, right? But in the case of Belize, I, I like to be more specific. And our situation is quite unique because with regards to the United States, they don't have a, an ever-looming situation with a neighbor that is claiming X amount of their country. So again, the, the research is Belize-specific, but I can understand what you're saying with regards to an overall perspective. I, I suppose, Paco, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear the actual links. Um, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of your hypotheses, which is, okay, a Guatemalan-born politician may uh, be right, may be elected and may eventually become the leader and then the leader of the country. So these are all possibilities. But how do we tie it down to say this action equates to a security risk? Well, I can only say that for those who don't share the perspective that I've, I've, I've shared with you, um, it may be informative to, once you go through the paper, you might gain, know, gain a better or, or, appreciation or viewers, for it. And, and please forgive me if I, I feel like you feel like I'm trying to get to this point. Well, our viewers don't have the luxury of being able to read this entire document, so we really want to get the core of it to even prompt people to go read it further. So in just saying that these are all possibilities that may happen, mm -hmm. rightfully so, there are many possibilities, but tell me what these possibilities mean in terms of security risk. What, what is your research saying? They're real possibilities, they're real yeah, risks. The, possi yeah. the, the possibilities are there, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. But what the, what does the, how does the possibility tie into a security threat? Well, for me, I guess because I'm so close to the research, it's, it's, it's quite evident and self-explanatory. Right? Uh, with regards to the different themes that I mentioned, mm -hmm. the economy, citizen security, national security, uh, sustainable development, all of these things, there's a cost involved with regards to them. Yeah. These selective governance practices that have been taking place since 1981 mm -hmm. to the present, they all have occurred with impunity for the most part, and there are costs involved. These costs can be economic, these costs can be um, social, or what have you. And with regards to Belize's security, the overall, excuse me, the overall notion that when you have, um, let's say, instances where there are, how can I say, um, you have instances where there are decisions that are being made by policymakers that aren't necessarily above board, because one of the fundamental aspects of the research delves into corruption. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, what what yeah. I'm hearing from you, and you can correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, is okay that the cost of corruption could have been better spent. Uh, that that would be my. Or the cost of corruption creates a security threat. Absolutely, absolutely. But and I, I guess I guess but, what, can I can I can mm -hmm. I maybe mm -hmm. because there's certain people who want to appreciate this conversation yeah. right now before they read the paper. Yeah. I guess what Marlene is saying, mm -hmm. and I think what will help them is if we go a little bit deeper to sort of like a Cliff Notes version of it, yeah. so that you might say something and people say, oh, that's interesting that Paco said. Let me go and read the entire thing mm -hmm. to unpack his entire thinking. Or to understand why or you understand made why that he said that. conclusion. So maybe just asking for a Cliff Note version mm -hmm. of, because you surely were connecting things together mm -hmm. and cross-referencing. So could you just give us like the Cliff Notes version of maybe, <sighs> let, let me do it this way. It's easier for you. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest security threat, and can you link how that threat yeah. tied back to one tied of these back practice? To, yes. The biggest security threat that I noted, or I, I wouldn't say the biggest, but I would say the most significant one was the, the signing of the 2008 uh, Special Agreement mm -hmm. in Compromise. Yes. Okay. And how, how so? Yes. How so? Ooh, let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had this discussion on many occasions. Yeah. And in terms of those security threats, let's see. First and foremost, from a governance perspective, the reality of the fact that uh, the government decided to engage in such an arrangement um, goes completely against the fundamental tenets of good governance practices and principles. 
And again, this research was steep with regards to the governance aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that um, came out in the research is that with regards to, <coughs> excuse me, good governance, it's premised on the fact that, number one, there has to be, uh, well, again, trust amongst the constituent parts, that meaning the, the people and the government, right? With regards to the way that they went about doing this, um, it was less than above board in that, number one, they just basically signed and they brought it, right? Now, one can argue whether or not it was legal or illegal or what have you. It was done, that's what they did. That doesn't necessarily mean that was, that was the best way to do it, mm -hmm. right? So as we move forward from that, we have to look at the, the potential or the possibilities or the, other, the ways that they could have done it in a more equitable fashion, right? In terms of the 2008 uh, special agreement that was signed, uh, there are other elements that really, really stood out with regards to the, the threats. Uh, fundamentally, by virtue of going into an agreement with those stipulations, mm -hmm. that in and of itself poses a potential security, uh, excuse me, security threat for the nation. A security threat with regards to risk and risk is something that, um, well, a lot of people have talked about from time to time. And I'm glad to hear that uh, more people are, are giving more credence to that aspect of it as well. Because with regards to the government's uh, rollout of the education, excuse me, educational campaign, they didn't really touch on the risks, the inherent risks. So your basis of the, what you said is, is the, security threat that stands out to you the most is directly tied to the signing of the 2008 special agreement mm -hmm. um, because of, uh, in fact, we have had many conversations about, because of the concerns you have as, as, as a no campaigner that what the potential outcome may be at the ICJ. If I could just make it absolutely clear, again, my opinion expressed here doesn't derive from me being a no campaigner. Okay. So it's, it's, based, it's based specifically from a research perspective. And as a researcher, though, I do give credence to the significance and the salience of risk. I'll give an example. Um, in my paper, I talk a little bit about um, diplomacy, mm -hmm. right? And I quote Freeman from 2008, and it basically says, at its most basic level, diplomacy is the management of foreign relations to reduce risk to the nation while promoting its interests abroad. In this task, diplomacy's success is measured more by what, is, what it precludes than by what it achieves. One can never prove that what didn't happen would have happened if one had not done this or that. But for the most part in foreign affairs, the fewer the surprises and the less the stress, the better. Mm. Can, I, can I move away a little because I'm still, and, and, and it, is, it would probably help to to, to read the paper, I assume, because yeah. I'm, I'm trying to understand it mm -hmm. from not somebody who's a researcher. Mm -hmm. um, let's look, go back to the issue of one of the threats that you found um, to be the nationalization of Guatemalans. Yes. How, how is that? Are you able, do you go through the numbers of Guatemalans who have been registered in what area, in what period of time? Do you sparse it down separately into those who are nationalized by marriage, by birth, by whatever else? Sorry, not by birth, by, nation, by um, parents. parents. And how do you measure that threat? If it's more than 5%, is that a threat to national security? If it's more than 30%, what percentage of the persons who have nationalized are a Guatemalans and are a threat to any voting process? Again, you touch on something that I would consider as part two of this type of research, right? Uh, again, I said that it was done with regards to the scope of the research conference, mm -hmm. but I definitely see where this particular paper can dovetail into other elements. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and well, I can appreciate it. Maybe the reason why I keep on mm -hmm. asking those questions because the paper seems to be a conclusion. The conclusion is that these things are threats. Actually, it, it ends up with a question. It ends up asking a question. And what is the question? Well, <clears throat> let me see if I can find it verbatim. Mm -hmm. 
And if you can't find it, okay. you can yes. In keeping with the theme of the second National, Belize, excuse me, National Belize Research Conference, Belize's security, strengths, opportunities, and threats. Okay, several approaches were used, and it basically ends up by asking, let's see, of course it's not. Doesn't research paper normally answer the questions though? Well, <laughs> hey, sometimes you have to be unconventional, right? <laughs> It basically puts forth the, the question that after looking at these different issues, people are asked to, number one, assess whether or not they believe that the issues that were brought forth constitute a significant risk. And if so, the purpose of the paper is also to engage individuals so that this dialogue can start. Because I believe that fundamentally, and again, I said from the beginning, whenever we talk about security threats, we normally look from an external perspective. Oh, mm -hmm. a threat is coming in, right? So the paper fundamentally ends up asking believers. Switching the perspective. Yes. Yeah. Now that we've switched the perspective, do you give credence to this? Do you believe that these security threats, and not just the ones that were listed there, because there are a lot of others uh, emanating from within, do they amount to a significant sec security threat to the nation of Belize? And, and when you say security threat, you just don't mean externally. You also, I mean, there's citizen security, which is a huge issue for Belizeans as well. Absolutely. Is that also tied into the research? Um, I, I don't want to guess as to what you mean by citizen security, but... It means the security of the people in no, the country. Well, no, what I'm asking is that, are you meaning like citizen security, for example, like gun violence in Belize or of something? Of course. Like? Okay, the paper doesn't deal with that specifically. And I wanted to know because I didn't want to answer without mm -hmm. knowing what you're referring to. But so no, when you're talking security, you're talking external. External? Yeah. But also internal, but not specifically to what you just referred to. Okay, yeah. Paco, we're a bit running out yeah. of time, and so I don't want to miss this opportunity for you to probably say what you want people to extract after they read, read the paper. Mm. What is the... Core. Uh, yes, the core, the essence of what you want them to walk away from it thinking and doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, fundamentally, I would like for those who read the paper to take into consideration the normal perspective that is given when we're talking about security threats to the nation. I would like for them to look at the governance aspect of Belize and also with regards to uh, policy making. The decisions that our policymakers make and give credence to the fact that those selective governance practices that are made by our policymakers come at a cost. And decide for yourself whether or not that cost is worthy of further discussion and deliberation. All right. All right. Well, thank you for coming in. Once All again, right. this research paper is actually accessible online. People can find it once they Google it. Yes. It's uh, Enemy Within, Selective Governance Practices, Police's Greatest Security Threat. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And as we said, we are officially kickstarting a coverage uh, leading up to the May 8th referendum. Our next conversation is going to be with a panel of artists. And we're going to be talking about how they're using art as social commentary on this historic vote next week. That's coming up after the break. Yeah.